I am so deeply honored to be welcoming you here tonight, today, this afternoon. This is one of those moments in my life when I would not be anywhere else on this planet. What better way to celebrate Earth Day than in the honoring of James Donaldson? Here at the very center of our community, at the confluence of two great rivers, the Twisp and the Metau, which in the words of James's favorite song, the Metau River song, from the jagged cascades rushing down with the snow and home to the ocean and round again, oh. And it's really wonderful that so many of you chose to spend part of your Earth Day here celebrating James. I'd especially like to acknowledge two members of James's family who've come from far away to be with us, Pamela Donaldson, James's sister-in-law, and his nephew, Johnny. And for many of us, it's really a huge pleasure to be getting to know them. James Walter Donaldson. You lifted us up, you challenged us, you prodded us to be even better than we thought we could possibly be. And you who so often spoke of the sacredness of place were for us a place of solace and hearth, really a home that we came back to over and over again. You said our fire, our sacrament is to dwell poetically upon this earth. You, James, railed with, with fierce determination against the wrongs of our society and never gave up trying to right them, did you? You really, for so many of us, chronicled the currents of our time in letters. And I wanted to read something that you wrote me years ago about letters. You said, letters reveal to us how we might sustain life rather than merely survive. How to create a place that lasts, that has a future that can be perpetuated. You said, I call these kinds of correspondences the letters from the perpetuators. And you certainly were a perpetuator. You gave us at least 20 years more of your vitality and inspiration than any of us really expected. So I have to say it, James, you weren't perfect. And I think we're gonna hear quite a bit more about that 
uh, this afternoon. I hope so. <clears throat> James had this remarkable ability to draw out uh, mo the most intimate stories of him, his friends while actually revealing relatively little of himself. <laughs> Michael Price, sitting here, said that he figured that James made sure that no one person knew everything there was to know about him. So our hope today is that by hearing more stories that your, the breadth of your understanding of this amazing man will be increased through conversations with uh, folks from, from far and wide. And um, there's a lot of information back there on the board about James, some remarkable pictures of him from different points in his life. We'll also be suggesting this afternoon that we consider the question of what James would be saying now to us. And I imagine many of you have been revisiting your memories of James through perhaps letters or poems, and I've been doing that. It's an incredible treasure trove, and I could just go on for a long time, but I want to share just one little pearl that I found in a letter of 20 years ago. James wrote, Ah, friends. Friends manage to put a happy face even on the strangest times. That deep friendship was his with Jim Kahn. And Jim has come to join us today, all the way from Los Angeles. He's a retired Methodist minister, was once the mayor of Santa Monica. And like James, he has committed his life to justice and consciousness. So please welcome Jim Kahn. There are six directions that we human beings move. There's the direction that we move when we go to the east. And there's the direction that we go when we move to the south. And there's the direction that we move when we go to the west. And there's the direction that we move when we go to the north. There's the direction that we move when we go into the sky. And there's the direction that we move when we go into the earth. And there is a seventh direction that we human beings go, and that is the direction that we move when we go inside. We are here to honor a man who took us inside and helped us explore that inside so that we would know what direction we were going outside. I had to write these words because I'm supposed to tell you about James Donaldson, Los Angeles, and the 1960s in the next seven minutes. So here goes. From the New York publishing world, James came to Los Angeles where he was theologian in residence at the Woodland Hills United Methodist Church. That church uh, and that suburb were white and conservative, and Jim stirred the pot, as we all know that he could do. He had these suburban church people reading Albert Camus, watching Bergman films, <laughs> partnering with the, a black church in South Los Angeles. So when the Watts riots erupted in 1965, he filled a truck with necessities, food and water and diapers, and led a group of these church people into Watts. That story made Time Magazine. Nan Self was a young seminary student. She had just given her dissertation to the typist and was headed to Georgia for family affairs. And James gave her a copy 
of the feminine mystique to read on that long Greyhound bus trip. Nan says, by the time I got to Georgia, I was a different woman. <laughs> and when she returned, she tore up the dissertation she had written and wrote one about women in the church. And years later, Nan Self became one of the first co-directors of the Commission on the Role and Status of Women of the United Methodist Church. That's what James did. He was always giving us books to read that changed our lives. He was always asking, what are you reading? Yeah. Or, have you read? I met James Donaldson on a weekend with the Ecumenical Institute. Ecumenical Institute, um, let me just say, there's a photograph of the founder of Ecumenical Institute back there on the wall. So uh, if you want to know more, you can look at that picture. Ecumenical Institute, or EI, as everyone called it, was a Chicago-based center of radical theology. EI had weekend trainings around the country, and I attended my first one when I was still an undergraduate. Donaldson was there, and he had probably recruited half the 200 people who were in the room. E.I. pushed the boundaries of religious thinking, and that's what James did. He pushed the boundaries of how we thought and how we expected to live our lives, and he pushed our lives towards justice, racial justice, body justice, feminist justice, earth justice, economic justice. And after the Watts riots, James started organizing the Corridor Ministry, a project funded by the National Council of Churches and managed by a civil, young civil rights lawyer by the name of Jack Pratt. The Corridor Ministry was the first effort in Los Angeles to pull churches, black and white, into the same organization to advocate for justice in South LA. And while whites fed, fled the area, that organization laid the groundwork for the first community college branch and the first hospital in South Los Angeles. Mm. The next time that I met James Donaldson, I was a seminary student at Claremont. He asked me to recruit other students to support draft resistors in downtown LA. And so we did, several carloads, several times. And then he asked me to use my sabbatical year from theology school to run the logistics of the Urban Plunge. Now the Urban Plunge took 100 white college youth and suburban church people and immersed them in the city. Friday night, go to peep shows and gay bars, and they talk about repression of the body. You've heard of that. Saturday, go to South Los Angeles to meet with activist black leaders, to East LA and meet radical brown berets, then talk about oppression. Do Sunday morning with, uh, about justice uh, with a rock band, unheard of at the time. Then wrap up with a call for people to abandon consumerism as the tool of suppression that lures middle-class Americans from living a life of justice. Stuff all that into 54 hours. That was the urban plunge. We did one a month for a year and a half, interspersed with demonstrations against the war and nuclear power plants, recruiting people for the next plunge, caroling alternative lyrics at Christmas, taking food and support to striking farm workers in Delano, driving draft resistors to the next safe house, training staff for the plunge, reading books, of course. 
all that intense time together led to a series of communes, of people, groups living together in a network that we called the New Adult Community, which was a name stolen from a project that was going on in other cities, notably by one led by Richard McKenna in San Diego, and his son Paul is here today with us. Well, that's the old. James Donaldson prodding us toward consciousness and action, pushing us into new ways to live and constantly affirming our gifts. He was the first person who told me that I was smart and he taught me to read, not just for my mind, but for my life, not just for my life, but for the lives of others. He pushed us into consciousness of selfhood and community. Sometimes he pushed too far, of course. When I told his old colleague, Jack Pratt, that Jim had died. Jack has now been, uh, for some time, a long time elected official in uh, the state of New Hampshire. When I told him about Jim's death, he wrote me, you know better than most the strange relationship Jim and I had. I respected greatly, admired his organizing skills, but decried, feared, and couldn't control his excesses. We were oil and water. I to establishment and gradual, he too radical and confrontational. I think we used each other sometimes for the betterment of the community sometimes to the detriment of our personal relationship. And many of us will recognize that description. James was over the edge for many of us. And so when James and a group of new adult community decided to go back to the land, Glorieta, New Mexico, those of us who were committed to the city stayed. And like the movement of the 60s, we broke apart, going in different directions. I stayed in the city. My calling was to a region called LA. I stayed to do what James taught me to do, to prod consciousness, to build community, to do justice, to change everything you can inside and out. I would not be who I am. I would not have done what I have done. I would not be here today except for those intense, crazy times. I would not be here except for James Donaldson. James Donaldson, presente. <laughs> Hello everybody, my name is Johnny Donaldson. I'm uh, James's nephew. It's been about 20 years since I've been here. And Everybody's gotten a lot uh, older. <laughs> I wanted to talk about um, Jim as an uncle. Um, as a family member, he was incredible. He was there for every important event in my life, for almost every birthday that I could remember. He was a tremendous influence on me. He brought me to Twist at a very critical stage of my development and it introduced me to a lot, and at the time, very weird and strange people <laughs> who worshipped rivers, <coughs> told stories, and enjoyed children. Most of all, my uncle taught me how to be a Donaldson. And currently, I'm the last Donaldson male in my family. And this is something that Jim has prepared me for my entire life, and something that I struggled with um, being very young. For those who don't know, Donaldsons don't last very long. Uh, Jim broke the curse um, in a family who the males don't usually live longer than 60. And uh, Jim beat that by a lot. He taught me about building a community, 
something which, um, you know, I built my own in Long Beach, and he uh, always told me how proud he was of that, that we had the same group of friends we had since we were in second grade. And he knew all of them. And he remembered all of them, and they loved him. And, you know, I grew up in Long Beach, a pretty tough area, and these were tough kids, and they all appreciated Jim. And I say Jim, you guys all call him James, but he's been my Uncle Jim my entire life. And I can still hear Jessamine in my ear yelling at me, his name is James. <laughs> and I would say, no, no, he's not. He's my Uncle Jim. You know, friends call him James, family called him Jim. I know a lot of people call him Jim. Teaching me about being a Donaldson male was our incredible stubbornness, our ability to be a big pain in the ass, our genetic defects, and how it's affected our lineage for 200 years. And what Jim liked to talk about the most was our predisposition to alcoholism, something that he preached at almost every birthday I had and at my wedding. He was also uh, the family historian, gathering documents um, and researching with my Uncle Donald. And to this day, we have a family history of about 200 years and about three briefcases full of documents from the Civil War all the way to the Indian Wars. And that wouldn't have been possible without Jim. So he was just an incredible person, and I know he touched the lives of everybody. But, you know, as his nephew, um, I couldn't have asked for a better uncle. For the family who I'm representing, I want to really thank uh, Lee Swayze and Carrie Brown, Maggie Kuhn and Logan Price, Susan Evans and Bill Lehman, and Sue Swartzall. I was 1,500 miles away and there was a blizzard when um, I got the call that uh, Jim was you know, at the end of his life and if I was gonna come up here, I needed to do it now. And unfortunately, it wasn't possible. I took great comfort in knowing that the people who I had met early when I was young uh, were here to comfort Jim at the end of time. And uh, it brought the family great comfort uh, knowing you guys were here and that you were communicating every step of the way, and we knew Jim's wishes were being followed. So thank you, and thank you for everybody for coming out. Um, we really appreciate it, and it's going to be great to hear the stories that you guys all have. Thank you. Hi, my name's Logan, I know a lot of you. Um, those I don't know, I look forward to meeting you tonight, I hope, um, if not in the future. This is James's kind of maybe last attempt to bring us all together here. Um, it's hard, I just, I didn't know, I'm not the best at being prepared. I feel like James was always more prepared than me. Um, and so I didn't even pack very well. I'm actually wearing his sweater right now, which he was always trying to give me while he was alive. And I always kind of was like, no, James, I don't think it's quite my style. Um, he was actually a very style conscious person. And it's sometimes hard to tell, but he was. Um, maybe the most style conscious in the Meadow Valley, I don't know. Um, so I guess it's fitting that I forgot to pack and ended up wearing this sweater. Um, and I, I actually, I bought these shoes yesterday at the senior center, so there's, there's a good chance those would belong to him too. But I, I, I spent a long time this morning, uh, got up early, didn't sleep much last night, but got up early and sat down by the river um, and thought about him. And I, I really felt like he was there with me for a minute. Um, and I think a lot of us have these moments uh, now and then since he's passed. Um, and I don't know what, depending on what you believe in, maybe he's there with you or not, or maybe just uh, you're there with his memories or your memories of him. Um, but I couldn't really think of what to say, and I thought, well, you know, like, James, whenever I had an important speech to give or a, an article to write or something, um, I'd always call him or go over to his house or whatever and ask him, James, what, you know, what do you think I should say? And that never really worked out very well. But he would... <laughs> He'd say, well, it has to come from you. And then I'd say, well, thanks, James, but, but I want to know what you think. And he'd probably take me over to his, uh, his desk in his little study and uh, pull his enormous copy of the Oxford English Dictionary off the 
overburdened, almost collapsing bookshelf. Um, and he'd, he'd make me bring out the, or flip to the pages on the word voice or something like that, and have me read it aloud to him. Um, so, and then maybe like a couple weeks later, I'd get in the mail a manila envelope with uh, photo, giant photocopied pages um, of that exact article covered in post-it notes. <laughs> Anyway, I've done my best to, to recreate that uh, tonight, so. <laughs> Illegible handwriting. Um, so just a, a, couple, a couple things here, because I think this is an important um, thing that James would share with all of us, obviously. Um, voice, sound or the whole body of sounds made or produced by the vocal organs of a man or animals in their natural action. A sound or sounds produced or emitted by something inanimate. A stream, thunder, the wind, etc. Musical instruments. An expression of opinion, choice, or preference uttered or given by a person. A single vote. The utterance of an invisible guiding or directing spirit. The expressed opinion, judgment, will, or wish of the people a number of persons, or as indicated, shown by the exercise of the suffrage. Um, and I think James, the reason why I wanted to do that is because I think James, uh, uh, James was always helping us find our voices, um, whether it was in our relationships with our closest loved ones, with our children or our parents. Um, or whether it was in our community, um, or whether it was against those who wished to take our voices away. Um, he was always there encouraging our voices, and he really encouraged that in me a lot. Um, I got to know James as an adult. He was with me all my life, but I got to know him as an adult um, through the political work that I did, um, particularly. And I, and I, I want to just say something about that real quick, because I learned as, as almost a student of his, and as a, almost a grandson, and as a best friend, um, that he, that that came from him, not from a, his, his politics were part of who he was deeply. Um, they weren't, uh, it never came out of self-righteousness. Um, and I think it came from when his, from way back in his life and his deepest longings and desires from seeing his, uh, seeing the land that he was raised on being damaged by pollution to seeing the inequities and the violence and the racist South that he grew up in chaining the, the locks of the, of the church shut when he was a teenager to protest segregation. Um, and he was often marginalized for that. Um, and he had plenty of stories about that that it took me years to get out. Um, but he never gave up. Um, and I think he never gave up because that desire and that longing in him was so powerful, it never let him off the hook. Um, and I, sometimes it was a great wellspring of joy for him too. And I, was, I felt lucky to be present for one of, I, th I think, probably the happiest moments of his adult life um, in 1999 um, when he went to Seattle to protest the World Trade Organization. And I think he found there a movement that he had been missing since the 60s, and it became a home for him, even though he was living here in the Valley, where he didn't always have that much access um, to, to being in the street. Uh, but he would always encourage me, and we, we began a relationship as adults based on that. Um, and he often supported me, and I came back to him um, for advice and wisdom, and, uh, and as a confidant. But it was never, I never felt like I was doing his work for him. I always felt like um, he was supporting me, also being who I was, and we met there as adults, um, and that was invaluable to me, um, and something I'll continue to miss very much. Um, but he, um, in, that, in the van ride back from, from the World Trade Organization, and in Seattle, I caught a ride back with him. We weren't there to protest together, but I caught a ride back with him, with uh, Bruce Spencer. I don't know if Bruce is here or not. Um, but uh, in that van on the way back, I think I was a freshman at, at Liberty Bell at the time, he, uh, he was over the moon. I was a, a little shell-shocked and kind of excited, but he was absolutely over the moon. And I've almost never seen somebody that happy or excited. Um, so I want to remember that part of him, too. I think that's part of what that beginning being able to be part of that beginning of the largest grassroots uh, social justice movement in history was an important part of what he carried with him um, through his life.
through the rest of his life. Um, I was going to read a little bit from a letter he, he sent me after that experience. And he said, everyone who was there on that significant day knew that this was not just an event. Instead, this was the beginning of a great movement of people from all over the world who had gotten it clear, who had seen each other's protest to the global destruction of the environment, the global murder of our best citizens in every land for their fearless protection of their places and their peoples. You join today in a fine new time, a new opportunity to find your way home to a meaning and purpose that feels as honest and sweet as your own natural integrity. A typical of James to always work in an incredible compliment in every correspondence. <laughs> Um, so anyway, I think, I think it's also worth mentioning that the, the plunder of our natural resources, the world that we live in now, um, the war on independent journalism, the money takeover of our democracy, uh, the decimation of the American middle class, and the neoliberal race to the bottom, um, the, the proliferation of profit-driven dirty wars around the world, and the looming threat of climate change um, were all things that I think he probably saw coming a lot longer before the rest of us. Um, and I think um, we may have gotten tired of hearing about them, um, but he was right about it. And I don't think that came from any sort of natural prophetic ability of his own, but just the fact that he was an incredible listener and he listened to everybody. He found the best writers and read the best books and read thousands of book reviews. I don't know actually how many books he actually read. He read a lot of book reviews though. Um, so I think, I think if you believe if you believe in the, in the afterlife, um, you could probably take some comfort in, in the idea that uh, it'll be a little more organized when you get there. And, uh, if, if, there's any, if there's any rivers up there or down there, they'll be a little bit clearer, cleaner. Um, I'm sure even the river sticks is more pristine now. Um, but I wanted to just share one last thing. I hope I have time. Because um, he wouldn't let me off the hook without reading a poem, as nervous as I, as I might be. So this is, um, I want to share with you guys the last poem. Actually, the last time I spoke to him on the phone. Um, this was probably a week before he passed away. He read me this poem. It was hard to find this book. And then I think Leah found it finally underneath a bunch of junk mail in his apartment. Um, alone with presences, paying my tax bill can't wait. Some huckster hawking condos in Belize can't leave a message. King Death can keep his terrors to himself for once. I live by preference in space where clocks have no time, or where clocks have no hands, and time is what it is when there is nothing else to think about. Infinity takes over long enough for me to reunite with those I loved the most. It eases me to feel they're near, which proves those gone are never really gone. I play backgammon with my father in a dream, and I lose and I lose. I'm talking Plato with my brother in Annapolis. It's then and now where FDR and JFK stay quotably alive while Marilyn Monroe survives and thrives in all her blonde availability. Are these as everlasting as my aunt's devotion or my mother's smile when she sang or how my brother faced his last epiphany without a whimper? Who says that those who've gone are ever out of sight or mind. They're present, just invisible. They visit when they choose. They rule the world. So James, I hope you visit us whenever you choose. You rule the world. Hi, my name is Leah Swayze, and I'm here to introduce a little video about James, and I, I brought some notes, but I forgot to put on my glasses, so I can't read so. it. <laughs> okay, so, so this video is 
derived from an interview that Terry Hunt did with James in 2008. And um, it was, uh, he was collecting material for a documentary that he made called With Respect to Farming. And that, that interview was over 40 minutes long. So Maggie and I got together and um, chose sections of that interview that we felt were reflective of James's long-held values and that were particularly relevant to this time and place. And Terry kindly edited that down to a video of eight minutes to share with you. So I, oh, and one other thing, um, Terry is gonna make that available on his website in the future. So that's metaotv.com. So I've seen this video um, a few times, and each time I've been very struck by the different forms of James's voice. You know, his um, politically, poetically, philosophically, lovingly, and in particular, passionately insistent. So before we watch this, I just want to um, invite you to join me in taking a deep, slow inhalation and a slow exhalation. So from James to you. Hello, I'm Jim Annist, and I have the unenviable uh, opportunity to follow that. I think I would like uh, maybe just to take 30 seconds or something to let that sink in. I don't think that's something we should rush past. Thank you. Um, I've actually given a little title to my reflection. It actually has two titles. Um, the first one is, What a Friend He Was. The second one was, is, Who Was That Masked Man? Um, when I was a boy, not so long ago, many families like mine got a magazine called The Reader's Digest. I don't know how many of you remember that magazine. Uh, I guess it's still around, but when I was young, my favorite feature was a uh, regular thing they did called My Most Unforgettable Character. And I think that many of you uh, probably share with me the sense that James, who we just saw, was the most unforgettable character of my lifetime. Um, And the question then becomes, why, why was that? Um, why, why and how did he burrow so deeply into my psyche and for so long? The James I knew rarely experienced peace and was deeply embedded in despair. To me, James was profoundly wholehearted and brokenhearted. The key question for me as I gathered these reflections was how should I take my limited knowledge of his life and the complex gift that it was and allow it to influence whatever life I am privileged to continue. James had a powerful presence and he made a real difference in the lives of the people that he met. Somehow he gave me a feeling that I too, that I could too, he showed me that maybe, just maybe, my life could be more passionate, more noble, and more righteous, more like his. I met James in the fall of 1976 at the first annual Psychotropic Mushroom Conference at Miller Sylvania State Park. <laughs> um, that experience is a story for another day. Um, but at that time, I was in law school, and he had come to town, which was Olympia, in order to uh, earn some money for the commune at Libby Creek Farm. Um, he came from a place that I had never heard of. Um, they pronounced it Methow, even though it has an age. Um, James and I immediately hit it off. I was drawn to his vital energy, his bright eyes and generosity, his edgy and nimble mind, and of course the fact that he liked me. And seemed to think that I was interesting. Did you hear those two me's in that last sentence? My profound lack of emotional intelligence responded to his intensity. 
As our dialogue developed, I found myself, sure enough, becoming more passionate, more noble, and more righteous almost by the day. In James's eyes, I was not just another schmuck lawyer wannabe. I was going to save the world. I was capable of and responsible for righting what was wrong. And there were many wrongs. In James, there was more than a little bit of an Old Testament prophet. Eight years later, when I became a father, I was not just another not-so-young dad of a cute little kid named Molly, um, but I was in his eyes redefining fatherhood for Western civilization. <laughs> And of course, doing it as no one had ever done before. <laughs> now, I did some pretty cool things in those days, but oh, how I loved my growing passion, nobility and righteousness. As a young man who has lost his own father at nine months of age, I was now apparently special to a charismatic older man who lived large, thought deep, and had a plan to, to redeem at least some of the pain that many of us felt in our time. That experience alone might qualify James to be my most unforgettable character. However, that was only the beginning. Our friendship morphed and remorphed over the next 40 years. Hundreds of visits and phone calls. Over that time, James and I lived out gradual but profound shifts in our roles from father, son, teacher, student, peers, brothers, uh, all sorts of roles, occasionally spiced with disagreement, disappointment, and estrangement, often nourished with tenderness, gratitude, and long shared memories, and finally with the vulnerability and preoccupation with his long failing body and the fear that that engendered. What was most unforgettable to me uh, was what I experienced as James various qualities which long appeared to me to be to be glaring contradictions. Uh, more than anyone I have ever known, the intensity and luminosity of James's polarities were, to put it quite uh, bluntly, were breathtaking. Uh, as we reached through the masks of one another's personas, we kept discerning layer after layer of richness, compassion, and dysfunction. I know how we laughed at them all. <laughs> Through our long phone conversations, as we became more vulnerable with one another, James became even more mysterious and contradictory. As he grew older, that mystery of those contradictions and my reactions to them pushed, pushed me to grow. How could one person, I asked, be both so wise and foolish, so profound and petty, so affirming and critical, so present and absent, so authentic and candidly a bit of a, a poser. Um, I saw these contradictions not as evidence of hypocrisy, although we all have some of that, but more as polarity, complexity, mystery, and paradox. Um, this does not disturb me, uh, for in my view, nor does it disrespect James, because Nearly all of the deep truth that I've learned in my life now comes in the form of paradox. I speak of James today in love and in candor and in pursuit of my own deep need to help put his life in the context of greater wholeness. He deserves no less. James wore his contradictions in high relief with what often appeared to me to be remarkably little self-awareness. James was so richly contradictory because he was so very human, because he was so very alive, because he cared so very much. And in the richness of his contradictions, of course, I encountered my own. And in the light of those contradictions, I grew to live, to love, to risk, to choose, to care for who and what, who and what I cared about, and to remember to remember what matters most, and in the end, he helped me to become much more passionate, a little more noble, 
and I hope a lot less righteous. Thank you for your being, James. I was asked, with the privilege of being the oldest Coyote Camp kid, which I'm not sure that's true, but I'll take it for now, <laughs> to assemble the Coyote Camp kids. And, and, and I thought I would talk a little bit about what Coyote Camp is, because maybe not everybody knows what it is. So I thought, first I thought, well, how old is Coyote Camp? How long has this been going on? And I'm not quite sure, and the people I talked to weren't quite sure, sometime in the 80s maybe, but you can see this long enough for all these kids become less like kids and more like adults, and have kids of their own. And they're smaller kids, and this will go on. And I think this is the key part to Coyote Camp, especially for James, because he had this in his heart. He wanted to have a place for children of the time to know that we all could gather together, and we would know a place and a time that was held by the community that would always be there in these uncertain times. And Coyote Camp has been that for a lot of us. We've learned to swim, we've told stories, we've gone on hikes, and it's held us, it's held me, and it's allowed me to know a place in the world where it's important to have people's arms around you, even when it's really, really scary to do so. And so I just wanted to have a little opportunity to have each of us as, as kids say a word, and then we'll do what we do at Coyote Camp, which is howl. <laughs> and maybe Espen will start the howl, we'll see. So my word for Coyote Camp is heart. I would say wise. I would say family. Community. Love. Wild fun. Laughter. Community. Craziness. <laughs> Stories. Being held. Trickstering. Transcendent. Inspiration. Capture the flag. <laughs> Play. I know Logan already said it, but the only words for Coyote Camp are definitely capture the flag. <laughs> okay, so the one thing we always do at Coyote Camp is howl. Espen, what does the coyote say? <laughs> Sometimes coyote has to be really quiet, especially when he's hunting for mice. Are you ready for a howl? One. things that I think James had this capacity to do was to see us, to see us as individuals. And it was like he had learned from Madame Curie, you know, he, he, he could have this x-ray vision to look at immediately, surprisingly fast our wombs, and our gifts, and our potentialities. Potentialities that we ourselves couldn't see, or perhaps didn't know about. And so this time in the program, we wanted to make sure that we could hear as many voices as possible about your own experience, because James's relationship with you was unique. Uh, 
just like you are unique. And so we're going to do a couple different things, and I want to hear as many different voices as possible, like uh, for any of you, a word that describes James. Who was this masked man? Let's hear, let's hear, let's hear some. Passionate. <laughs> Chronically. Mechanically handicapped. Authentic. Playful. And playful. Gentle. Quite loud. Quiet. And... No! <laughs> no. Interested. Encourager. Inclusive. Poetic. A human being. Yes. Generous. So. Let's, let's move this for a second in terms of what is a word or two that describes his, your reaction to him. What, when he was with you, what was going on inside of you at different times? Let's hear a couple. Surprise. Surprise. Grateful. Challenged. Encouraged. Mutuality. Perplexed. Yeah, with all these different little shades of meaning here. Connected. What was that, Joan? Get me out of here! <laughs> yeah. Fear. Being seen. And challenged. Generative. Confusing. Yeah. All these different things, like a kaleidoscope, right? Of different feelings and Justified. different response. Justified. Appreciated. Empty. I thought you were going to say panicky. Uh, <laughs> maybe panicky is better. Empowered, elevated, and motivated. So James had this capacity to see you and to look at your potentialities. What is a potentiality that James saw in you that you're coming to appreciate more and more because he saw that? Because of James, I, that you're a more compassionate person, courageous. Poor. <laughs> yes. Felt honor. Yeah. He, he saw in you something that could honor. You found your voice. He gave you a window to look through. You became part of something bigger. So expanded courage and authenticity. Other potentialities he saw in you. The creator of beauty. A lifelong support pillar. Yeah. Look around, yeah. Emotional presence, protector of the river. You became more of a protector of the river because of James's life. So, James, as you know, was a very poetic soul. Uh, he introduced us to a lot of great poets, and a lot of great lines. And I want to do a little bit of an experiment here of us creating some poetry. And we're going to do three sentence poems. So I'd like somebody to um, come up with a first line uh, that might be part of this poem. Uh, who has the first line? In saying goodbye, next line, we gather together. And the third line, knowing we will meet again. In saying goodbye, we gather to go together, knowing we will meet again. Let's hear another one. The well is deep. Path is long and irritatingly <laughs> rocky. Sure. Let's do a couple more. What's another line of a poem? Together we will traverse, the circle is broken. And the third line? What are we waiting for? And one last one. The time is now. To do is right. The time is now to do what is right. And you will do it. And you will do it. What's better than that? So, um, we know that you are filled with story. We also know that you're filled with feeling. Some of you have had an opportunity to process your loss, James's passing from our lives, passing into our lives in new ways. 
some of you have not had that opportunity, and your stories today are deep. You know, there are certain times in a life where you're with an assembled group of people. Every gesture is sacred. Every word is sacred. Every breath is sacred. And this is one of those times, isn't it? You know, where, where you're feeling, I'm feeling, we all are feeling the sense of the remarkable moment. The remarkable moment that is now, that contains all. Uh, so, let's just breathe that in for a second. And just take this moment of silence to bring that into your own sense of being. Well, Bill, are you ready to play some music? Okay. Uh, this is the Hotel Ragtime Jazz Band. Let's listen. Uh, these two songs we're going to play um, are played in all the New Orleans jazz funerals. So, and we lived in New Orleans, so we would follow along. They would turn around and come dancing back to the center of town where the party began. about today we realized that this event would not be complete without the call to action <laughs> right here a week from tomorrow the people's climate march starting at 3 30 a um, group of folks is working really hard to create an event we'll be joined by people around the world doing the people's climate march so here's what I'm going to do, and you might consider doing this too. I'm going to be thinking as the days go on about all of those issues that mattered most to James. The purity of the Methow River, the sacredness of Black Pine Lake and Spirit Mountain, the rights of people of whatever orientation, sexual, political, religious, ethnic, ethnic, global climate change, and on and on. And I'm gonna find a way to keep a conversation alive with James, to imagine that I'm calling him up on the phone and talking to him about what I'm up to and feeling his support for that. <clears throat> and so I just would suggest that you consider where your passions and James's most intersected and make a renewed commitment to whatever it is that 
makes you feel most empowered and able to make a difference. Imagine the collective power of all of us fanning out into the world with the inspiration of James Donaldson in our hearts. So I'd like to invite Carrie Baum to come up. You know, she has been really, really the glue with lots of other people, but look around you and uh, let's have a round of applause for Carrie. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read a poem, and all of you, many of you, mostly, you know how much James was into poetry and gifting poetry. Um, there was a stack of poems that he had Xeroxed that had the intention of going out into the world that um, are on the back table there, and I encourage you to look through them and take one or two or three or four, because that's what they were meant for, uh, Xeroxed by his own hand. So also, as many of you know, he spent a couple of uh, the last years of his life in Arizona, and he had a chance, chance there to embrace his interest in the Tohono O'odham tribe. And I have a poem written by Ophelia Zepeda of that tribe. And, um, you know, it might have been a favorite poem, but I think he had a lot of favorite poems. But this is a special one that he, he gifted out to people. With the dawn, we face the sunrise. We face it with all our humility. We are mere beings. All we can do is extend our hands towards the first light. In our hands, we capture the first light. We take it and we cleanse ourselves. We touch our eyes with it. We touch our face with it. We touch our hair with it. We touch our limbs. We rub our hands together we want to keep this light with us. We are complete with this light. This is the way we begin and end things. Finally, we'd like to conclude by asking you all to rise and join hands with your neighbor. And I'd like to offer the melody of James's favorite song, the Methow River Song. I am the Methow, a river I am. I carry the blood of life across the land. From the jagged cascades I rush down with the snow, then home to the ocean, then round again, oh.